most of us are at home today, uh, we could be wearing pajama bottoms for all anyone knows as part of what's called social distancing, the move to reduce the number of social interactions in the course of daily life in an attempt to slow the spread of the virus. And I think that alone illustrates the scale of the pandemic and the world's response. But it also illustrates that countries around the world have implemented similar measures affecting billions of people. And that takes me into a piece that Professor Broadbent authored last week in the Conversation Africa, along with Benjamin Smart, who's an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and also with the Institute for the Future of Knowledge at UJ. That piece was titled, Why a One-Size-Fits-All Approach to COVID-19 Could Have Lethal Consequences. It's had 100,000 views or even more since it's been posted. And Professor Broadbent's been interviewed on radio and television about the piece. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to serve as a launching pad for our discussion today. Um, so we'll get into some questions for Professor Broadbent. If you have any questions um, for either of us as the discussion goes on, he's asked me to post a link in the chat box to his blog, um, which he often updates with these days with stories about the pandemic and his thoughts. So please go there and post any questions you have. You are using the computer. Okay, I can now wear. Okay. Okay, so why don't we start um, off? I mentioned this piece. mean when you talk about a one-size-fits-all approach? I'm sorry, John, we were all muted for a moment. Could you just repeat your question? Yeah. Yeah, so you talked about a one-size-fits-all approach to COVID-19 in your piece. What do you mean by a one-size-fits-all approach? So the, the, the responses that have been um, implemented around the world and the guidance that's been given by the World Health Organization has been um, univocal. Uh, and generic. So there's one set of guidelines which concern uh, fundamentally social distancing with one set of goals which is to flatten the curve and reduce the rate of infection so as to reduce uh, the rate at which people are infected and the number of deaths from COVID-19. And uh, both the, uh, the consequences uh, of the measures that are being implemented uh, and the context uh, in which they're being implemented uh, as they as and the, the interaction between the two um, have not been differentiated in, in the advice that's being given so um, the advice is uh, generic and univocal and the concern of course is that uh, the world is a, a very uh, varied there are many different countries and many different places uh, what what works in one place may well not work and, um, and even if it does work um, and can be achieved it may be that the consequences are outweighed by the negative consequences of that. Sorry Prof, can so, I interrupt a little bit and ask people to mute your, 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 your videos please there's a disruption, disruption at the end please mute on the left okay. Please, everybody mute. Okay, Prof, you can go ahead. Thank you. And if you read, for example, the latest version uh, of the report that's uh, been very, very influential from Imperial College London, uh, they acknowledge um, that, uh, uh, they specifically say that um, the economic effects of the measures uh, that are needed to um, have the most effect on the on on the spread and severity of the virus that is lockdown may be uh, uh, the economic costs may be disproportionate in some countries they use the word disproportionate the concern that that i had and the ben had was that this is simply not getting adequate attention in the public discussion um the the narrative is look everybody has to lock down right now it is the only thing to do and there's very little discussion of what this means in particular, the very little discussion of the health consequences of economic costs. So people see it as economics versus health, and it's not. In this part of the world in particular, economic uh, downturn means, uh, for many people, means starvation. So uh, it's very much not about an abstract plunge in the stock markets. It's about uh, severe hardship, poverty, starvation, malnutrition, which of course disproportionately affects infants, while this disease massively affects uh, uh, older people and, and 
affects children and younger people very little. You mentioned a lot of different things there, but I first wanted to ask what the response has been like to this article since you posted it on March 23rd in the conversation. Well, it received a lot of response and a lot of attention. Um, I, if I'm honest, I expected a, a considerably more disagreement and more pushback. In fact, uh, the, the majority of the response has been uh, fairly receptive. I think the reason for that is simply that um, the point we were making uh, was fundamentally correct. And that the fundamental correct point is that uh, what the, the, the needs and the context of developing nations in general, and Africa in particular, actually had not been considered. So when people talk about flattening the curve to bring it, bring the, the peak of the epidemic within what a health system can, uh, can cope with, for example, they're assuming there is a decent health system to which a decent number of people have access. That is simply not true in many countries. And in those countries, uh, you simply have to ask whether that is in fact um, going to make any difference. In a logical extreme, if you have no healthcare system at all, then blackening the curve makes no difference. Um, obviously, most countries do have some healthcare. Um, and of course, you can say that um, uh, the, the worse the system, the more you need to flatten the curve. Um, but still, the point is that uh, countries differ um, markedly, and this simply wasn't part of the global narrative. And if you look at the World Health Organization's website, it's still the case that I can tell. You look at the technical guidance, the guidance to regions, the regional websites, you look at the Africa, the World Health Organization regional Africa website, there's nothing on, um, there's nothing really on the context. Um, uh, what's, what's there is things like, you know, why the region is going to be faced with challenges because the healthcare system is poor. There's nothing really on uh, tweaking the measures that are being advised to make them appropriate for the context. There's nothing, there's no advice on how to lock down a township um, or on um, whether it makes a difference uh, if the median age in your country is half the median age um, in Switzerland or Italy. All right, so I think I'm hearing a couple of concerns. The first is that uh, the actual effect of some of the measures that have been tried elsewhere in China, in Europe, in North America might have not have the same results in different contexts in which geographically speaking, um, politically speaking, um, people live in very different contexts. And so it might not be the case that we can think about the intervention simply as just, you know, separating people um, in order to reduce the number of daily contacts if in fact it's not practical or even you know, plausible to separate people who live in more condensed areas and different social structures. That's right. Um, one also has to consider, um, and this was a factor in Italy too, that in many African households, uh, generations live together. And this was a major reason for the, uh, the, the situation in Italy is that in Italy also generations live together. And this makes lockdown uh, considerably less effective uh, because uh, in, in, I mean, it's not necessarily a good thing, but in countries like the UK, uh, older generations tend to be uh, isolated from families and placed in old age homes much more commonly, or to live on their own if they're still able to. Um, and that, it, it, that, that seems to spread the, the, the slow of the disease somewhat. One of the concerns that appears to be the case in Italy is, is that that wasn't the case. Of course, um, Africa is like that too. In fact, commonly, uh, grandparents are primary caregivers for children. Um, so in that context as well, even if lockdown were achieved, um, uh, you, you may still have problems within households. It's also clear that uh, when people are confined together, as happened in the, in, on, on, a, on that uh, cruise ship, um, uh, Diamond Princess, um, that can amplify the effects of, uh, the, the effects uh, of an infection or the spread um, uh, and if you also have the, have a number, so if you have a number of people locked down in small spaces, say you know suppose you have ten people in a uh, you know in a single dwelling, and you also have a degree of mixing because people are uh, walking to sanitation that is not in their dwelling, for example, um, then it's not clear to me 
uh, that you have something uh, that is in, in any way really resembles what lockdown means in uh, Wuhan, for example, where people are getting home deliveries of their food, of their groceries. Uh, you know, I mean, it, you can't, if you're living in, in Alexandria, you know, people are not going to be relying in general on home deliveries of groceries, um, or in Geneva, um, or even in a suburb of South Africa. And then there is the sheer, the sheer uh, unreasonableness of expecting people to stay within a dwelling like that for 21 days. It's, it's you know, it, 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 people, you know, there's been a few people who've sort of commented saying it's only 21 days. Well, you know, confinement for 21 days in some situations is a form of punishment. And I'm not clear whether this would be a form of punishment or not, but it, 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 it's certainly clear that for wealthy people, lockdown is a, is a much nicer option than for the poor. And it's notable, of course, as usual, that the people who have recommended and designed these measures do tend to live in uh, much nicer settings. So you're the director of an institute called the Institute for the Future of Knowledge. We're at a, talking in a session that's titled Predicting in and for COVID-19. So how does one predict what's going to work in South Africa? It might seem like the best we can do is to use previous countries as examples, look, look to what's worked there, and then hope to maybe tailor the interventions that we use in this context. Um, some people have suggested alternatives to social distancing that range from mass testing of the population for existing immunity for people who have been infected, for asymptomatic cases, and so on. Um, public health systems that survey have massive surveillance over the population, identify cases quickly, and isolate them. People now are even suggesting everybody use personal protective equipment, PPE, to reduce the spread from asymptomatic individuals to others. There are proposals that are being um, discussed in the public forum, but it might seem like in order to predict what to do, the best thing we can, the best strategy we can use is to turn to what has worked in other contexts and at least see if we can tailor that response here. So how, how do we predict what will work in South Africa? Um, we do, of course, have to look at what has happened elsewhere. Um, what we should not do um, is simply extrapolate that uh, onto the local context without considering the local context. So I think rule number one, and this is well known, when you are moving uh, from one context to another, um, is that you have to consider um, what local factors uh, might uh, uh, turn something that worked effectively in one place into a disastrous intervention in another. And we know for many health interventions uh, that, that uh, whether they work depends on context. For example, HIV transmission um, in, uh, in rural KwaZulu-Natal was, uh, was shown um, to be effectively prevented by, uh, by measures that, that had nothing to do with the measures that were um, uh, effective in, in, in the West. Um, and the way they realized that was by looking at coupling patterns and power dynamics. Um, and they realized that uh, the, the measures that were being advised in the West simply wouldn't, wouldn't work, um, not because they physically wouldn't work, but because there, there would be no uptake. Um, and there are some famous South African epidemiologists who um, have been very well recognized, one of them won a Nobel Prize for exactly this point. So we know that for infectious diseases in particular, in the South African context in particular, um, quite different interventions may be necessary uh, to reduce uh, their spread. So we know that as a matter of, of, of how to uh, conduct health policy. Um, uh, so con first point is the context uh, is important. The second point is that you have to consider a range of expertise, and that's because different experts work in different domains and they tend to be focused on different consequences. So again, if you look at the report from Imperial College London, they're very clear. They say, we are looking at deaths caused by COVID-19. We are not looking at further consequences of the measures. We are looking at what measures are most effective for reducing deaths caused by COVID-19. They're very clear about this. They even go so far as to say that this can't be used uh, as a direct, uh, I can't remember the exact phrasing. They say, look, you can't just use this to make your decisions by. Governments have to uh, take this into account along with other factors. However, if you only, if you ignore that part, or if you get hold of an expert who isn't as, as sensible and modest as that, then you'll get advice uh, and you'll get predictions that relate to only one outcome, such as deaths caused by COVID-19. 
obviously if we you know if we save um what 10 million lives suppose uh through our interventions with COVID 19 but then 30 million people starve uh, as a consequence of our interventions then purely from a health perspective we made uh we made a mistake um so you need to consider different experts um and in particular i think economists health economists and social epidemiologists brought into a conversation along with infectious disease epidemiologists and governments need to think um need to need, need to listen to those groups so to make to make a good prediction you have to firstly consider context you have to secondly take your advice from a number of experts but the third thing that's crucial i think is that you have to ask what could go wrong and i have this uh, general model of prediction which i've published on i, I included it in my first book on, on the philosophy of epidemiology. Uh, the fundamental component of that model is just, you, you don't you ask what might go wrong. So you look for reasons to think that the thing you are predicting works. Um, and it's remarkable how simple it is and how rarely that seems to occur. Um, so in this case, for example, um, you, you take lockdown, you say, what is the effect of lockdown going to be? You look at what, what effect it appears to have had in other countries based on the graph. And then you think, okay, that's what we hope to happen in South Africa. And then you say, well, let's think about how, what, what, what could it be not happening? In what scenarios might that not happen? And then you start thinking about what if there's a big meltdown? Mm -hmm. or what if people don't stay locked down? Um, and so forth. Um, and I think that very simple predictive exercise and that very open discussion of ways things might go wrong I'm sorry, we'll just ask everyone to just mute their microphone in the bottom left of your screen if you could. Thanks very much. Okay, so you talked about people like economists and social epidemiologists being involved in the, dis in the discussion. I think that recognizes that things like social distancing are not, are not simply an infectious disease intervention. They're not like a vaccine or an antibiotic. Um, it's essentially a social intervention yes. and that requires for it to work, a certain social context um, and certain other supporting realities. You need to, if, if what you're doing is you are sending a public health message out to a that in the first place would need there to be the proper communication channels for information to get there. The population would have to have trust in the authorities that are making the recommendations. If these measures are not purely voluntary, you would need some sort of mechanism of enforcement and so on. So it's not just simply like a, an antibiotic where if you want to know whether or not it works, um, you would just ask the clinical trialists or the microbiologists. Um, if we're talking about a social intervention, it seems like you might want to ask someone like a social epidemiologist. Is that basically what you're saying? It is. In fact, I'd go even further and say that even for the kind of interventions you're describing, you still need to ask a social epidemiologist. So the epidemiologists I mentioned before are um, uh, uh, Salim Abdul Karim and Karisha Abdul Karim, um, and they uh, they showed that um, uh, encouraging the use of condoms was not effective to prevent female uh, to reduce female infection rates in rural KwaZulu Natal, not because of any problem with condoms. I mean, they work. Uh, the trouble to prevent HIV infection. Uh, the trouble was the social context um, made uh, made it very difficult um, uh, or very rare for them to be used because um, uh, young women were on average getting the disease at the age of 15 and, and uh, men it was peaking at 25, implying that there's a coupling pattern uh, with a 10 year age difference. Um, women don't have the power to make the men wear the condom and so forth. So they had to come up with various other means that were under the control of the women. So, so even um, uh, for something where we know it works um, physically, um, the, the, um, uh, the intervention still needs to take social context into account. So yes, in one, and in one sense, this is like that. Social distancing physically we know works. There's no question that being distant from other people will prevent the spread of COVID-19. If you go and sit on top of a mountain for a year, uh, while the epidemic, the pandemic rages, you will not get COVID-19, um, assuming you're not in contact with anybody else on top of the mountain. Um, so in one sense, we know it works, but in the broader sense, in the context, as you say, it's a comp to implement this, in this intervention, um, 
is complex and requires a, so, a complex set of social uh, maneuvers, of political maneuvers. Uh, it requires a, a much higher degree of compliance than any state could possibly, um, could possibly enforce. Um, uh, and in a state that is less capacitated and where you, as you point out, there is less trust uh, in authority and in the state uh, where communication is poor. I mean, the, um, uh, uh, pe uh, people in the townships are anecdotally reporting that they simply don't know anything about this lockdown or this disease except what they see on TV. Um, so it's, it's you know, very unclear that there is actually good communication going out. Um, and in, the, in that situation, the, um, uh, uh, the intervention isn't just uh, this physical thing of physical distancing or social distancing. It's a whole set of measures uh, which you have to take to get people to do that. And that package can be, uh, must, of course, be different in different places. It has to be, have any chance of working. And it can be considerably more difficult to implement in, uh, in, in, in some regions than others. The other component a prediction that's relevant to deciding what to do is predicting what will happen if you uh, don't do anything. Yes. Um, to do that, we, we've we used models that have relied on data from other countries. Those models have told us that people who are older, especially people over 70 or even over 80, people who have existing chronic diseases like hypertension, heart disease, chronic respiratory disease, are most at risk of fatal consequences of the illness. Has there been the kind of modeling in the South African context or other countries in Africa that would allow us to predict what will happen if COVID-19 is allowed to reign unchecked throughout those populations? Um, I'm actually not sure uh, that there has been such modeling, or if there has, it has certainly not been widely discussed. What we see, uh, what we see a lot of graphs of is the modeling of the spread of infections, uh, how fast the diseases have spread in different countries and how fast uh, it is likely to spread in South Africa. Um, what I'm concerned may not be uh, taken into account adequately is the extremely different uh, age uh, uh, demographics in the different countries which may mean a different risk profile. In fact, it's very likely that there are very different risk profiles in the different countries, even if we don't know exactly how they differ. Um, if you look at the list of countries by median age, uh, the bottom 10 or so are in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a, large, a, a, a substantial proportion of those are the median age is below 20. Um, the median age in Italy is about 47. It's, it's, you know, it's one of the highest, and it tops out with Japan, which is somewhere in the low 50s. Um, this disease, um, I, I was looking at a study that was published a couple of days ago in The Lancet. They're estimating in that study, uh, um, uh, I think 0.32% of, of, of um, uh, cases under 60 end up fatal, 6.4% above. So uh, the average South African male is dead by the time they reach 60, uh, because the, uh, the, the life expectancy in South Africa is 59. Of course, that number will be lower uh, in townships. For, for women at 65, the difference is presumably to do with violent death. Um, and in other, other sub-Saharan African countries, it's, 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 it's fairly similar. Um, so there is, and this is what the, the, the report from Imperial College is alluding to in a very, in a roundabout way, when it says disproportionate, uh, dis disproportionate costs. If you are facing very severe threats to your life, um, and you are, say, 40, um, and you face threats of violence, of uh, other infectious diseases, such as malaria, um, uh, for example, um, then it's not at all clear that you will see this as a significant threat. Um, you can, of course, and this argument has been made when uh, so-called millennials have disobeyed the rules in the Western world, you can say, well, you need to uh, uh, take measures to protect the elderly. But there aren't, and people in Africa, of course, do greatly respect their elders, but um, there simply aren't uh, large, anything like as many, uh, elderly people in the region. In, in Italy, 4.2 million people are over the age of 80. Uh, 
And in Italy, 80% of the deaths occur in people over the age of 75. It's simply not clear as a public health problem, as a problem facing the population, that this poses the same threat. Now, it may be, and it may well be, that there are comorbidities and there are other diseases that afflict uh, the African continent, which uh, counteract this effect by increasing risk in some other way. And I simply don't know uh, whether that is the case or not. Um, I don't know whether sufficient research has been done, and I don't know whether um, uh, whether it is being done at the moment. Um, but I, um, I'm sorry, I've got a small child uh, who's just wandered into my uh, lockdown Zoom. Apologies for that. We can ask them about um, their opinion too, but um, since we're running out of time, I did want to just give you, a, give you one last question. So what suggestions do you have in the immediate future um, yeah. in order to decide what to do predict what will work in the South African context. Do you have any ideas then? My number one, I mean, the, 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 there are some very immediate practical things that can be do, done to alleviate the, the tension in the country in South Africa and probably in similar in other countries in the region if they implement these measures. You can allow people to go and take exercise. I mean, in, in most countries, they do allow this. In South Africa, they don't. And the reason that I've heard is, oh, well, then everyone's going to go out and they're just going to say they're exercising. Uh, for me, that is a, uh, a betrayal that indicates that there is lack of trust. If a government says that to somebody, uh, they are saying, we don't trust you. And if they then say, oh, you know, come on, please cooperate, they're, they're, confl they're contradicting their own message. So I, I think there's a matter of principle there. You can't expect people to cooperate willingly and then at the same time impose regulations that assume they will not cooperate willingly. So, um, and, and in it, fundamentally, it's a terrible public health measure to say that people can't even go for a walk. Um, there are large spaces, football fields and so forth, even in townships that one can uh, go for a walk on and so forth. So that, that, that kind of loosening the measures where they are unreasonably restrictive, allowing people to smoke. Smoking is bad for you, but if people are in situations of grave anxiety and they're long-term smokers, forcing them to quit is not gonna do anything to alleviate the situation. And the mental health component has to be considered. Um, it very rarely is, um, especially where uh, poor people are concerned. Uh, people, the, the assumption is simply that suffering is all physical, and that's not the case. Um, more generally, the, 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 the region has to look at the economic consequences and the, so, the health consequences of those economic consequences. So if you crash the economy, people live hand to mouth, can't eat, families start starving, you have a health problem. Um, uh, and all the health problems that, that, that are attendant um, uh, on malnutrition. Um, and I think those need to be urgently considered. I think they actually are now being considered. Now we're in lockdown, there's a sudden realization we can't do this forever. In the last week or two, I've seen the conversation switch. It's too late, it should have been considered first. We are gonna see negative consequences, but now all the measures I think uh, need, to be need to look at the holistic health consequence, not just the deaths by COVID-19. Uh, it is taboo to say this, but it may be that the, the measures that reduce the, the risk of COVID-19 most are not the appropriate measures. It may be that you'll reduce the total burden most uh, with a measure that allows more COVID-19 deaths, but reduces massively deaths from uh, the deleterious consequences of economic lockdown. Um, and I think that a proper consideration uh, of all the possible consequences needs to be considered, and they need to be weighed up, as opposed to focusing solely on deaths caused by COVID-19. Okay, thank you. So um, that's about half an hour. If you want, we can take some questions from people, Alex. And then we have... Yeah, we, we, should, we can take maybe a, a few minutes of questions. I would just say as well that the conversation can continue on the link that John has shared because uh, that is through my blog and uh, the comments section in the blog. Um, but I think there needs to be a protocol for questions. Uh, I would suggest that if somebody wants to ask a question, they can indicate this in the chat. John then select the person. But also request people to keep their microphones on mute in the meantime. Okay, why don't we do that? So if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box and we'll uh, read it out for you. Mm -hmm. 
It's question time for people who want to ask questions. I did mute people earlier, but I've unmuted them. So anybody who would like to ask a question can go on. 